and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome on to the show Sigurd Bergman. Sigurd, thanks so much for making time for us. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, it's it's really a pleasure. Uh, for people who don't know you, you're a professor at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And you've been very active in uh, Nordic and international conferences and events on, on all con uh, continents, really, uh, in so many different fields, religion, theology, uh, environmental studies, arts and architecture, culture, and uh, doing so much important work in, in eco-theology and religion and ecology, uh, publishing, teaching, conferences, national research councils. I mean, you do a tremendous amount of work, um, including you know a lot of books. Uh, I wanna mention just a few including a couple that came out recently. You have this wonderful edited volume, Sweden's Pandemic Experiment, uh, which just came out. Um, also a, uh, another edited volume, Religion, Materialism, and Ecology. And uh, some other good ones, uh, Weather, Religion, and Climate Change, came out a couple of years ago. And a, a classic, Religion, Space, and the Environment. Uh, so really just so many important books and so much groundbreaking work. And uh, so I want to chat with you about your perspective on religion and ecology, all the work you do. And to start out, one of the things I always like hearing from people is how did you get involved with studying the intersection of religion on the one hand, and then the environment and space and place? Because of course, for a lot of people, your know, religious studies and environmental issues are seen as totally separate. If you want to study the environment, you study science and policy. And if you want to study religion, you're talking about the transcendent. You're not talking about this world necessarily. Uh, so I'm curious in your in your personal life, what brought you to this kind of research? Uh, how can you talk about the transcendent without uh, talking about this world, right? Uh, so I think you cannot, never ever. But uh, so it started in the '80s. So all of this, uh, I worked in a parish in Malmo. Sweden's three third largest city in the center as a reverend in the Church of Sweden. I mostly was busy with peace issues at that time. Uh, so I established a local group, were elected into the national board of the Christian peace movement, lots of anti uh, nuclear disarmament, uh, pacifist, Sweden is a big producer of weapons uh, in the world. No one wants to talk about it. They are so glorious in the peacemaking, but uh, producing weapons at the same time for all over the world and, and lots of things. Uh, I was so also quite busy with the ecumenical, committed to ecumenical uh, work at that time. I'm not born in the church, okay, I'm baptized, but not grown up in it. So it was, uh, so the interconfessional differences uh, have, uh, I have not much understandings for Christians fighting each other, right? Uh, so, so Christian faith is something we have in common and maybe all religions have, have lots of lots of things in common. So um, I was sent to a representative to one of the first uh, European church meetings, um, 89, I think, for the peace movement in Basel. It was, it was a very hopeful time at that time, right? Uh, the anti-apartheid movement was successful. The South African regime were collapsing. The Soviet Union were collapsing, the GDR, were breaking down, Germany was reunited. Uh, there were some nuclear disarmament agreements and, and we had quite lots of hope for, for uh, making progress into a better world. It was really very, very different from our contemporary uh, feelings, situations, conflicts, wars, whatever, right? Um, but, uh, it was more when I when I planned to switch over from the church to the academy for a PhD uh, education and study. What what should I write about? Right? What 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 should be the the sources, the theme, and so the problem formulation? Uh, it it became obvious for me that it should be something with nature, creation, environmental. The environmental movement 
was there, but it was just started to get more and more dynamic. Uh, uh, so, okay, what kind of sources? Uh, Ecotheology has, hadn't really started yet. Moltmann had published his uh, Ecological Doctrine of Creation. I think he, he subtitled it. And uh, uh, there, was, uh, there was a beginning in, in, in Germany, uh, in England, in the States, uh, uh, of course, but it, it was very fresh at that time. So my idea was to, to somehow find a bridge between the environmental mo movement and uh, theology, the church's faith communities, right? Um, the second uh, intention with this uh, dissertation project was, uh, I had uh, just uh, come over in a, in a bookstore, a small, small book learned by Gregory of Nations, late antiquity, Eastern, Orthodox theologian in Cappadocia, two of his homilies, uh, uh, Love to the Poor and um, Love to the Stranger, they were entitled. Um, I just did read them without any telos intention. It was just uh, for a course where I had to read some classical sources and so right. Uh, but I was really, um, surprised, shocked, uh, um, embraced somehow, uh, touched by, by, it was so relevant, it was so contemporary, it was so important, it was somehow interpret, interpreting my own um, time and, and, and context. And we had started to read Gutierrez, liberation theology had emerged at that time, came to Europe, uh, uh, we were very fascinated and somehow he did the same thing as Gutierrez and the liberation theologian. He said that the best expression or proof for love to God, love to your neighbor is love to the poor, right? So that was liberation theology in the fourth century uh, in, in Eastern um, uh, Middle East. Uh, so... Um, so I just had to uh, de dive into this uh, way of thinking. Uh, and what I found was a lot, a lot of um, creation, uh, aesthetics, uh, uh, entanglements of incarnation, inhabitation, the Holy Spirit, what I later on called Trinitarian cosmology. So it became a study of uh, the patristic source, the modern eco-theologians who were in the air, Rosemary Redford, Sally McFaig, Moltmann, and so on. Um, and uh, um, an attempt to, uh, to interconnect these. Well, very conservative uh, opponents, uh, the older teachers at our faculty said, this is crazy. You should never ever do this in an academic studies. You cannot take a modern problem in the situation today and take it back into the past and history and analyze them from that. But why not? Everyone does. Every biblical scholar does this, but they never ever tell you about their methodology, their intentions. They just do it and they, they take the Bible as a normative uh, source and they, they go back and they take the, what they find or what they think they find and what they need into the uh, uh, the contemporary and their own normative projects. So you should really, if you want to do it academically properly, you should really make it transparent, transparent and, and have a clear method for it. David Tracy's uh, talk about tradition and situation, for example, helped us a little bit, but also the older ones, Tölz in Germany and so, historical systematic theology. Uh, and I had very um, generous and uh, encouraging supervisors. The first retired, the second died in cancer after half a year. The third was in uh, in uh, Denmark. And um, when I was finished, I was really very, very uh, alone with this. But the book uh, made lots of lots of success. It was done in Germany in German and spread by a very good publisher in Germany. It, it was translated and rewritten, shortened, uh, 
uh, turned into a less academic language into the US uh, 10 years late. It was also published in Russian uh, uh, five years later and spread very much, especially in the Ukraine and leave. They have used it a lot of lot of because the Orthodox fathers mean very much to them, right? Uh, so it was interesting for them to get the Western ecotheology discourse, but also to see that one of their, what they regard as their own church fathers and theologians, central ones, uh, became so important. So, 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 so the book really made, uh, made its way without me, and it was just a surprise. Um, so, um, yeah, contextual theology was, was uh, a method and a program for me, a paradigmic stigmatic understanding of theology. We were the I were the first one with two other colleagues who took it to Sweden and uh, the book uh, God in Context was the third after uh, Schreit, uh, Bev and Catherine Tanner were publishing her thing at the same time as mine in Swedish translated into English then and, and so on. It, it, this was also very fresh. Now everyone says, oh, theology must be situated, but still they go on in a dogmatic way where they do not give priority to the experiences with the living God, but rather to the ideology, ideological um, uh, dogmatics, so, so to say. So, so we are still not there, but, but anyway, we, we have made big pro progress with the, with the context. So the, the dissertation book turned into a, what I call in the subtitle, in the German uh, subtitle, and um, um, ecological theology of uh, liberation, right? Uh, with, uh, as a Trinitarian cosmology, which I learned from the from the Church Father and the East Orthodox. So it was attempt to to uh, interconnect liberation theology, eco theology, and classical theology. Leonardo Wolf at the same time did the same did a similar thing. And we met when he got his uh, honorary professor at here in Lund University and have had contact since since then. His book, Cry, for the, Cry of the Earth, which is, I think, one of the real good ones. And Pope Francis still quotes it sometimes. Uh, that was written at the same time. And uh, Leonardo always wanted to do something with me together in the seminary, but it never worked out. He got a heart attack and he was divorced, and I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that was some kind of uh, similar approach, right, uh, to, to what uh, theology and uh, theology creation can mean for a contemporary uh, interpretation of, of what Christian faith is about. And I have worked out several parts of this later on. The, the primatology, doctrine of the Holy Spirit as inhabitation where God dwells in this world and and, and primatology, what it means in general for, for not just Christology and Karl Barth and whatever, but uh, uh, we we also need to talk about not just spirituality but also the spirit. There are so much rich things in the Christian tradition against fetishism, in accordance, I would say, with animism. Not all would agree, but I never had any criticism. Now, I, when I developed in uh, Christian primatology <laughs> as some kind of a neo animist uh, uh, theology, also for the environmental movement, right? So it's. It's it's a surprise in itself that um, uh, yeah uh, the spirit is everywhere and and um, anyhow nevertheless in a very concrete local embodied way and the spirit acts right so that was a long answer to a short question right <laughs> yeah it's a it's a big question though um, <clears throat> so I appreciate it sometimes people just say well. I was raised on a farm, and so I care about religion and the environment. Uh, so I, I like the longer answer, and especially that you were doing this at a time when the field didn't exist, and you know these you're really doing foundational work. And now, you know, people can get degrees in eco theology and religion and ecology and things like that. It's very widespread. There's journals, there's conferences, uh, but you were doing it when there really wasn't. Uh, you know, a, a field made yet. So this is such foundational work. And interesting, especially to hear how it intersects with 
uh, liberation theology, how you and Leonardo Boff are kind of doing some of the same work at the same time. Uh, that's really exciting. I would love to see some collaboration uh, between the two of you. That would be that would be wonderful. Um, I'm I'm curious. You know, speaking of you know, you have such a international perspective, and something like this. You know, uh, Boff is a you know Brazilian liberation theologian, and uh, here you are working in you know Swedish and German contexts. I wonder if you could say a little about what's unique about the European approach to some of these issues, religion, the environment, because uh, of course it's a little different everywhere. You know, the environmental movement in the United States has its own history and its own legacy. And uh, for the most part on this podcast, we're often talking to people who are situated in the United States or in North American context. Uh, so I wonder if you could say a little, what's unique about environmental issues or religion or both? Uh, in the in the European context that uh, that you're situated in, uh, I, I so it is very difficult to generalize um, on Europe, right? Uh, but if you compare it to the states, uh, I've been over sometimes, but I wouldn't say I I really get it. But anyway. I have lots, lots of more information about the USA and Canada than I have from Southern Europe, because there are not so many in the academics, right? Uh, so Europe is a very um, differentiated, diversified, colorful, manifold continent. Right? You have lots of lots of traditions, lots of past. You have differences between South, Central, and North and East Europe, uh, um, the war, the Cold War, the East-West barrier, but there is also a North-South barrier, mainly due to culture and language. They do not practice English nearby. They don't want to do it at all, but they, they, they are all good in Spanish, French, and so we in Central and Northern Europe are not good in French uh, and, and, and Spanish. So, so there is a language barrier. There is also confession, the confessional, the educational uh, situation in the academy is very different uh, in between Southern and Northern uh, Europe. Also, the church um, has a monopoly in the Catholic and, and Orthodox uh, regions. Uh, you have much more free universities uh, in the Protestant uh, and, and, and uh, North and so on. Um, of course, you have all these differences in the States too, but st you still have um, a common history of settlement, the settlers, for example, right? Uh, you say, someone says, uh, I'm grown up on a farm and I, I have, but uh, so uh, there is a um, there is still some consciousness that the continent belonged to the indigenous from the beginning. Uh, we as white Europeans came there, um, we colonized it, we, we built our societies. It, it was some kind of a colonial project that still goes on. I, I, I was in Australia a month and it, it was much more obvious there, of course, because the, the history is, is, is very, very short compared to the States. But anyway, there is a difference between the between Europe and, and, uh, and the States and Australia with regard to, uh, to that, right? Um, on the other side, in, in Europe, so we have um, figured out uh, some interesting um, uh wisdom we could say uh, so they have the european union when it if you take habermas for example habermas says that the society is, is a process of a communicative action it is the communication that that allows the cooperation it is the cooperation between different voices opinions uh problem solutions perspective that makes us so rich. And if we get this working, then we, we get stronger and stronger, even if we might be small. And so now all these experiences, they, they have been taken to the US, for example. You have Pierce and Habermas there, 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 there is there is lots of this also there. 
um, but um, so the struggles are deeper in, 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 in Europe. We have had all these confessional wars, for example, right? The Catholic, the Orthodox. Uh, okay, we have come through this. Christianity is rather peaceful than, than a, a war uh, producing a force, cultural force, definitively. Uh, but it, it has been a tough way uh, to that. And uh, the borders, as not meeting spaces, uh, but as delimiting, separating borders uh, are, are still there, definitely. You know? uh, so um, he, here it's very different in the States. You have one system, okay, you have the federal states and, and, and all that, but uh, you still belong to one and the same nation. <laughs> Uh, um, in Europe, we never are European. I always feel European when I have been on another continent when I come back. But I'm in the first place German or Swedish or, or Bulgarian or Italian or whatever, right? In, in our family, we talk three languages, always uh, uh, Swedish, Norwegian and and, uh, and German. Uh, but uh, And English upon this and, and in my work and so on. So so it's that that is that makes us rich, right? If it works, but it also produces conflicts and, and problems uh, in Europe. That, that is very different, I would say. What does it mean for ecology and now field? I, I wouldn't say that that we have so much differences between the US and the European eco theologians or or religion and environment uh, studies scholars. Uh, we are we are much more similar in, in a global. So globalization has has gone so far, and academy uh, we had all this exchange. Um, I would say it's it becomes different when you go to Africa or to Asia, uh, where they don't have these good structures for communication and cooperation. Not the money, see that they don't have libraries in Africa, right? Uh, South Africa is a bit better, but anyhow. So they shouldn't just uh, develop their future according to our paths. They should find their own ways. In Asia, it's a bit better, but it's split and divorced. And it's, yeah, what would you say about Chinese eco-theology or South Korea? It's a bit easier to get answers, but they stick to the US if they can. And, and, and uh, yeah, so it's... Um, it's it's still it's still an uh, an um, a deep ch radical challenge to get to get our field international. So it's it's still dominated by 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 Western uh, English speaking uh, ways of thinking. Right. 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 Uh, it's not only bad. We couldn't be ashamed for ourselves. That that's not the point. But. Um, and we have a fair, we have impacted on the whole world history with our processes of colonization, mm -hmm. missionary first, and and uh, economic globalization later on, and capitalism. So it's we're living in a in a westernized world, so to say. But uh, but anyway, we we have to figure out how to to cope with this uh, international multitude. Mm -hmm. I wrote, by the way, an article in front of the uh, encyclopedia of archaeological spirituality uh, on religion and nature in Europe many years ago. But I think that's quite good for the history writing. I was not among the pioneers. I was, let's say, the second generation, or, or let's say it was my big brothers, those born in the 40s who started it in Germany and uh, in some English, but it was my generation with Michael North, Godzilla, Dean Drum, and Peter Scott, and all these. We who started the European Forum for the Study of Religion and Environment. It, it was our generation who turned it into an academic field, and now now we are all happy that we have this. I saw Marie Evelyn and John Grimm were, of course, pioneers in the States. Uh, the Society for the Study of Religion and Nature Culture, where Paul took in the beginning with the architecture discussions, and so so we have these big three societies now, which which um, assist each other and establish it as a very clear, visible 
field of study in the academic. So we have succeeded to turn this into a block of uh, academic studies. And now the environmental humanities making us stronger and we making them stronger. So it's not only environmental history, eco-literature. And so it's, it's, it's a real environmental uh, humanities, which can enrich the environmental science, which has been earlier than we, much earlier, but they have not been interested in the humanities, although they all know that the problems are anthropogenic. So only the study of the human being can help at depth. But anyway, we still need a, a real transdisciplinary uh, cooperation between the, in, in, between the science and the humanities. So, so, so that has always been on my agenda also, right? Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning environmental humanities. That's been such a really big movement in the last, oh, 10, 15 years maybe, and uh, really has provided a helpful umbrella for a lot of people to do good research and advocacy. Uh, so yeah, getting this more global transdisciplinary vision, I think that's what we're all searching for. Uh, but yeah, it takes, takes a long time to build it up and to have the institutions to support it. And um, you know, speaking of you know being transdisciplinary, one of the things I appreciate also about your work is that when you're, you're talking about religion and its relationship to the environment, you don't just talk about the natural environment, you also talk about the built environment. And there's a lot of attention to art and architecture. And uh, to my mind, that's that's often missing in a lot of uh, people's writing on environmental issues. There's, there's often a, a strong focus on natural environments or the wild and, uh, and the built environment gets left out. And we leave that to people studying aesthetics and things like that. Uh, so I wonder if you could say a little bit about how architecture figures into your work, because uh, it's such an important part of religious history and such an important part of how we relate to the environment is, is through our built environments. Uh, when I started to study theology in the um, 70s, uh, so it was only words, right? language, words, metaphors, logocentric to say it for philosophically, and also the work on Gregory of Nations and, and the equilibration and classical theology, which I talked in the beginning, it was only words, written sources, ideas, thoughts, and so. So I was so tired about this after this um, uh, four years uh, working on the vegetable. So, um, so I, I, I stuck to uh, painting, visual culture, visual arts, modern arts. Huh? Uh, and I, I, I had a whole uh, research process for years uh, on indigenous arts in the northern Arctic at the Sami, which are the indigenous people in the Scandinavian countries up to the north, huh? 2,000 kilometers from here or two and a half. Uh, so... Um, and that, that was exciting and, and liberating for me because it was clear for me. Uh, so most of the per perceiving our environment, you can learn from neuro people, uh, is going through the eyes. Well, 95 or 90 percent or something like that. We take the surrounding into our brain and body through the eyes. So what we see. Uh, uh, matters, right? Uh, Tim Ingold, uh, which I learned lots of lots of things from, from ha has this big book on the perception of the environment. It's not how we think about it, how we talk about it, how we act in it. It is in the first place how we perceive our surrounding and ourselves in the surrounding, right? Uh, so, so the visual thing is definitively underestimated, uh, and especially in, in, in Western philosophy, theology, dogmatics, words, biblical. So we are so logocentric. So that was one of the, the project. From there, it is not uh, far to, to take it from um, the visual and what you see and how what you can learn from artists, painters. I'm married to a you know, painter and drawer, so, so it's it's not... Uh, difficult to understand why I, why I must reflect about how she can live in a world 
okay, she uses language and words, of course, but she <laughs> interacts uh, in another way with colors, forms, shapes, uh, and so on. Um, so it's not far to go come from there to space, right? Uh, I saw, and the same discovery was really crucial for me that we have such a um, cultural asymmetry in the Western thinking where time, time, history, the past is there always. It has to do with the 19th century, with the wars, with our history. Uh, of course, we, so if you look at Heidegger, time is the essential uh, uh, Zeit und Geist, uh, all this. So it's, it's, uh, I don't feel any need to, to criticize our emphasis on time. That has been very useful, um, healing, lots of potentials of, of, of healing uh, or getting our history into, into something that we can live on, where the past nurtures the present for the future's sake and so on. But, but space was definitely marginalized and underestimated. Uh, the, um, what Edward Sawyer called third space uh, sciences, architecture, geography, uh, design, uh, also to some called arts, uh, were, were, were definitely um, not uh, getting their, their substantial impact that, that we need in order to have a full picture of, of, of uh, how we work. Uh, uh, so, when I came to uh, Norway in 1999, uh, we established an art network uh, before the European for Nature, Religion, Worldview, and so. But a friend of mine, later on Archbishop in Sweden, were working for the Templeton Foundation. And the Templeton Foundation mainly is busy with the science and theology. I, I don't like their, their, their general ideology at all because it's only about ontology nothing ethical nothing political nothing that burns it is somehow to get a balance between uh, that yet you still can believe in this and that uh, without being bothered by by the critical sciences so it's 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 um yeah, it's a story in itself but anyway um, um she was uh, appointed for the european work of the of the templeton section and asked me, oh, Sigurd, no, 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 you are at the Technical University, Trondheim, where I worked earlier, I'm emeritus now, is the largest European technical university together with Zurich and the ATH. Uh, so there are really big elephants with 13,000 engineer students every year. And, and it's, it's a big place. And if you come, there is a humanities, theologian, religion, scholar, um, it's a new world, right? So the engineers uh, for just 60, 70 years ago, after the Second World War, they were never ever accepted as scholars. They were not in the academy. They were on some technical schools uh, producing their machines and so screwing with this and that. Uh, but later on, now they are dominating all of us. Right? because all governments, all companies want technical artifacts where they can make money. And the technical way of approaching knowledge is the most dominant thing. And it's not, it's, um, there is not really a well-working philosophy of, uh, and ethics of technology. They just go on and on and on. But there are lots of lots of committed engineers and technology scholars who were just crying for, for help and assistance to talk about the philosophical dimensions of uh, technologies. We did one work, uh, one uh, book after a conference with the Forum on Techno Futures, which I edited with uh, Celia Dindrom and, and uh, others. So it, it was really interesting. And, and Antje said this Templeton um, friend, uh, couldn't you, what would you need money for, for a conference or a project? And I said, okay, um, so there is a very good faculty of architecture in Trondheim and architecture is somehow um, a discipline 
where you entangle lots of lots of things, the physical, the technical, the cultural, the art historical, uh, the human, the political, the economical. I, I became more and more curious and became friend with the, uh, I've got two new friends, which I'm still very close to. The one has died recently, the others, uh, we are writing together sometimes. Uh, and it was really fascinating um, uh, to learn from, from the architects what space is. And uh, of course you have geography, you have theories of space, you had Edward Sawyer, who created the whole so-called third space uh, science with his projects, which I wrote about, and, and we also met in Manchester. So I, again, discovered that it's not only the visual that is marginalized in a fatal way, it's also the spatial. So then I wrote this article, which still is uh, lots of lots of readings and feedbacks, theology in its spatial turn. I just looked around, what do we have in uh, religious studies and theology about space. There is a bit more in anthropology, social anthropology, place uh, is a big term, of course, the local, the place, the local culture, and, and then the interaction between place and the, the indigenous and so on. Uh, but in religion, nearby nothing. Um, there, there, are, there are things um, in Chicago uh, attempts. Uh, and so, um, so it was so, um, it was so exciting, so I just had to move into this, right? Uh, so um, the, uh, I did uh, two conferences uh, together with others. There, there was an American um, a network um, for space and religion, which doesn't exist any longer. Uh, we had one in Denver, and this book, Theology of the Built Environment, is... is uh, uh, is a fruit of that. Uh, we have now also a very promising um, international cooperation where I only served as some kind of uh, consultant or, or, or so, where we have the cultural heritage. So what to do with these, uh, uh, all these religious buildings and sacred spaces in a society where things are changing. Uh, churches have to sell their property, they have to rebuild, uh, new parts of a city emerge. There is an interreligious mosques here, synagogues there, churches there, uh, Hinduist temples with all migrants into all modern cities, now a multi-religious uh, place. How, how should they, um, what kind of, what, what is sacred space in the late modern society, so to say, and how should we cope with the, with the, with the traditional uh, modes of houses, but also the already built uh, long history of houses. And in Europe, you have, of course, the substance uh, thousands of years back. So Italy has so much, they never can pay for anything. And they need lots of lots of help. In in the States you have, or in Australia even less, you have just a couple of hundred years and, and a bit more where you have old houses and, and the, in the capitalist society you never take care of this. In Europe we have laws where, where you protect the older buildings if they are regarded as historically uh, significant from art history and, and and this and that so 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 that that is uh, is another very interesting field and religion is not it's not only belief it is um, especially especially practice so to say where where the interaction between the built space and room and and what happens inside your own spiritual body and in the community or believers who gather is so important. Right? And, and uh, the most beautiful association you, you have in the States, the um, uh, Forum for Spirituality and Architecture, uh, who does great uh, events and has, has a wonderful network. And uh, uh, the ACSF. Uh, Tom Berry, uh, Julio Bermudez in Washington, uh, Roberto Ciotti in Canada, and, and uh, many others um, who, who have uh, gathered uh, and um, somehow 
um, really um, develop this whole field of sacred space, which is not a separate space, but the, the most interesting thing I think is how sacred spaces function, what they do to public spaces, to a city or a country or a region, right? Uh, so it's not only for believers, also a person who passes by in a car or biking or whatever, who looks at them religious buildings things happen in this yeah. and it's it's the whole thing of aesthetics that i'm really uh, interested in before we come to ethics it's always the perception of something first before we turn it into a problem that gets ethical political and so 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 sacred and, and building practices can tell us lots of lots of human bodily interaction uh, between the human and the environment. Uh, and that's why I like this term, built environment, but not everyone. Uh, there is some criticism against that terminology. But anyway, the natural environment and the built environment, it's not either or, but uh, as, we, we, as humans, we need to protect. We need to have shelters in order to survive. So so it's not just a filter between us and... and uh, uh, there's so much in it. And in the weather book that you mentioned, which is the, the last one really in our field, I have a whole chapter on architecture and weather. Uh, and it was horrible when I worked on this. It was growing all the time. Uh, I, I could have done 200 pages on it. It was just going on and on and on. Uh, so I hope it can inspire others to look at what weather does to us and how we, with the help of architecture, interact as human bodies with the environment, uh, which is a weather land or weather. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, that's, I love that book a lot. And it's just one of those things people talk about climate change a lot and often don't talk about weather. And of course, you know, weather and climate intimately related. And, uh, and yet we kind of lose the, the specific sense of, you know, our perception, our buildings, the way we relate to, to weather. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a really I like that chapter in that book. Like the whole book, it's just fantastic. Um, and you know, one book I we have to talk about uh, Sweden's pandemic experiment. Um, it's such such an important work. And overall, for the most part on this podcast, uh, this started a few years ago. So kind of in the middle of 2020, when the world was you know really going through the pandemic uh, in a very serious way, there weren't vaccines developed yet, and all of that. And uh, so even though this podcast has been situated in the pandemic, we haven't talked about it very much. Uh, so I'd love to hear about what exactly was happening in Sweden. What is Sweden's pandemic experiment? You know, it's not necessarily cheery news to, to discuss, uh, but important, important to reflect on. I don't know how to if I say should say so much in in in, uh, in our theme thematic uh, context, but anyway, I uh, so um, I, I think we are we are just still in the beginning to figure out what the pandemic has done to us in the states, in Germany, in in Sweden. Uh, we still we have reports, we have evaluations, and everyone thinks the pandemic is over now. As a virus epidemic, it is not, but it, it is under control. It's not uh, that kind of a threat that we had in 2020 and 2021 and 22. So it's it's under control. So um, and and most of most of them want to forget it now, right? Uh, uh, but it will come back. Everyone knows we will get more of this zoonosis. So there is, of course, in the beginning, something which also is relevant for, for our field of religion and, and environment, and that is the zoonosis. It is the, the, um, the destruction of the habitat uh, for the wild uh, animals. Uh, the, vir the virus are not, do they have any value ethically regarded? Uh, are they included in what we said, the good creation or not? Uh, they are there and they do their job and, and sometimes they jump here and there and they cross uh, borders and 
so there's nothing good or bad in it. Uh, the thing is that uh, and evolution is always testing and doing crazy things. And, and sometimes it just stops when it doesn't work. And sometimes it develops into horrible uh, biological processes. And, and sometimes we can take care this way to, to the vaccine. So, so uh, the, there is a connection between climate change, natural habitats, humans, animals, and the pandemic, right? And the virus-based pandemics. Uh, that, that some of us should, should dive deeper into it. Uh, but uh, I, saw, I was impressed by the virus, and I think we should be grateful somehow, because it, um, it made so much, to say it quickly, bullshit in our societies visible, that we didn't know about, or let's say we knew about it, but we didn't, we were not aware about how dangerous and deep these um, dysfunction was in our societies. And, and that is true for the States in one way, for other countries in Europe in another, and for Sweden in a very specific way. My whole understanding of what, what the Swedish society and culture is, was breaking down. It was an earthquake for me as an immigrant who has lived here since uh, uh, since 76 already, also in Norway, when I saw that the Swedes did everything wrong that they could do wrong, and they were not listening to science. Um, and um, it was so nice to hear Biden when he said, uh, now we will... Uh, we will listen to science and we will learn from science what to do and to, do, to try to do it right. In Sweden, it was the opposite. So this book, um, which is free download, by the way, if you want to dive into the Swedish experiment. So that, this is such so sad and so depressing because it is also an analysis of how a highly equipped and rich welfare country with a high self-understanding of community, solidarity, uh, knowledge, nation, and whatever, uh, somehow breaks down because uh, of power structures where power is not uh, negotiated and not managed in a proper way. And where science is there, but no one wants to listen, where you have a uh, a gigantic uh, process of uh, despotism. Dem it is, uh, you need some kind of a demonology to analyze all this. And there have been political science and historians and the virologists. And we created a, a, a COVID-19 science forum. And we wrote lots of lots of articles, even in the USA Today, which was a great success before the election, where we said, don't do it as the Swedish. Huh? And uh, it was very much um, <laughs> used in the US. It didn't uh, impact on the election, of course. But anyway, it was one of many, many pieces also in your election when we said this, because Sweden is still a model for the world and the good country and all this. And we did it wrong. And why did we do it wrong? There's no intention to learn from failures in Sweden. Just now, uh, we had a national commission, uh, which was wonderful and great in critical reports. They were just not listening in it. They were not, there was no accountability in the country. No one feels responsible for all the failures and mistakes and 10 to 15,000 uh, deaths that we could have avoided and should have avoided. No one no one uh, feels responsible for it. And as a Christian, you, you have problems with this kind of, of things and just silencing it and, and going on and on and on and as if nothing had happened. So, so there, there were lots of things that took three years of my life, but I never, never uh, uh, regretting it. It, it was so... Uh, much fun also to work with scientists, not on science and these uh, meta discussions on nature and, and blah, 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 but on the on the real concrete politics. How should we apply the best of science here and now? What is it? How do they do? How do they work? What do they monitor? And what's it, what's going on? And, and uh, sharing and exchanging all. And they, 
And as a person from humanities and ethics also, I could contribute lots of things. We wrote about more than hundreds of debate articles. We did YouTube talks, hours. So sometimes we had a million of uh, visitors, which is much as we have uh, 10 million population in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, lots of lots of uh, of uh, debates and 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 so. But anyway, it was a patriotic thing that took over the whole thing. It was patriotic to support Tignell and the government. They always did the right thing. Sweden's never can do the wrong thing. They only can do the right thing. We are the winners. We 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 get everything right. Uh, so, so that was anti-patriotic what we did. So, and that is not that is it's not good really. Yeah. So, to, you need a discourse as in Germany. You need to always to fight for and against different perspectives. Habermas communication, pro at contra, and and how should we do with this virus? And so, um, but there is a process of learning. The last weeks now we have a new social minister. Uh, who has obviously written our books, also my book, and and the, the National Commission report again. So he starts now processes of investigation uh, of the agency or this and that. So so that and he has not been in charge in the former government, so he doesn't need to feel guilty in any way. Uh, so there is something going on in history writing uh, now. Thanks to our, our work and also this book. But uh, for religion, also, um, there is another book by Volker Küster and Dorothy Erble Küster on religions on different continents. Mm. I think it is in English, uh, but published in Germany, where different essays on, on different um, countries, cultural approach. Uh, so, I, I, I cannot really see a, a, a hopeful history how religion has intervened in the pandemic emergency, so to say. There is, of course, a lot of diakonia of, of helping each other, mobilizing solidarities, local, local parishes, uh, individuals, and so uh but as you say as uh, there there are also a theological forum and and a couple of books and so um uh, the abc in australia i did one essay for they had one section on corona and uh, mm. religion uh, and their tele programs and so so but um uh, i saw um, you, you should you it, it's really interesting to also we need more investigation we need more research about what really religion has done for good and bad in 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 this pandemic emergency when it accelerated so so quickly and so broadly and uh, uh, so that there, there is something on religion and crisis right right should look at and and what i always wanted to do but never ever find the time or energy that is how are the analogies between the climate change crisis and the pandemic crisis similarities differences uh, so so that would be a, a, an international project uh, to take a look at uh, one more a bit later but now we have the war in Ukraine also, so it's it's not easy to focus on what crisis is taking your energy just now, uh, but definitely the climate uh, change will be there all the time. And and we are happy, Dieter Gerten in, in Potsdam and I were happy to be the first one. Here we really were the pioneers to, to put this as a research field, uh, climate uh, change and religion, uh, with these two books. And it was not the books, it was a series of uh, workshops. Uh, two in Potsdam at Einstein's uh, old institute, where the Potsdam Institute for Impact uh, on Climate Sciences located, and uh, one in Trondheim. And we just gathered people from, from different faculties uh, to, to talk and, and uh, interact. And these two books at uh, Bloomsbury and, and in Berlin were 
were the result. And that was the starting point for there. There are many others now. And, and that's that's really, it's also the climate scientists do appreciate this very, very much. Uh, because they, they need all they can get from the humanities to understand the human being, to make their prognosis about what, what could we expect from the human being to behave in this or that context. Uh, um, in our own fields, you never get any credit. You cannot do career. You said in the beginning that this is really a big field, teaching and lecture, but still most of the colleagues have not got the points. Right? But we are not simply in the margins. We are also well organized and structured with these societies and books and scholars. And they are getting more and more. I didn't do anything for the European Forum for Marketing or or, or trying to draw, draw other scholars into it. It's just growing by itself. About 10, 20, 30 every year, new scholars who are active in our field coming from all kinds of faculties and backgrounds, asking for a membership, uh, partaking in the mailing list, sharing their new projects and so on. So it, it's it's very hopeful that, that this is growing. The problems are there, so also the the, the scholars who want to uh, work with the problems are growing all the time. So so that's very hopeful, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And, uh, and that's probably a good note to end on. I like to end on a hopeful note, uh, especially talking about so many different crises, you know, war, pandemics, climate change. Uh, it's nice, nice to also see the hope as the as the crises are getting more intense, scholars are mobilizing at the same time. And, and your work is just uh, so exemplary in that regard, you know, doing this kind of transdisciplinary work where you're engaging with science and ethics, politics, religion, art, architecture, and always in a way that's addressing the, the crises of our moment. Um, so I really appreciate it. It's it's been a, a treat talking with you. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, and thanks to everybody else for for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with some more conversations for you soon. In the meantime, take care and be well. Thank you. It was a pleasure.